but I'm Kathleen Marr, and I'm from uh, John Petty Research, and David Cohn, my old friend, will sit down. <laughs> and uh, it's nice to be here at this reunion. Uh, I, lo I love coming. And uh, this, year, I, this year is sort of an elaboration on a talk I gave last year on uh, the practicality gap in which we, uh, we developed to try and understand how products would enter into the market. And I guess not, I shouldn't leave it at products because it's ideas and technologies and all of us are involved in selling some kind of concept. So who cares what I think? Uh, we're John Petty Research and uh, we focus on computer graphics and uh, multimedia. I write two reports, the Digital Content Creation Report and the CAD report. We also track graphics hardware. So why do good ideas fail? That's one of the first mysteries. We've all seen products that come out to the market and we know they're great. We can see that immediately, but, uh, but they don't make it or they don't make it as soon as we think they should. And why do good ideas succeed? And uh, I want to tell you a little bit about this slide. I, uh, I changed the way I do presentations uh, because I went to a, a presentation by Kathy Sierra, who's, a, who's been a trainer for Sun for years, and she says use lots of puppies and babies. <laughs> so you'll be seeing that. Here are the babies. So, what happens in between? Uh, products are introduced, technology is introduced, and um, and, and there's a lot of going back to the drawing board. And I think that that's something that has to be assumed. Once you, once you go through all the hard work to get something done and in a presentable state, you're a long, you're long way from done. And I think that's what we're trying to understand here. So as this is a pretty important topic to anybody trying to sell an idea, there's been a few theories through the years, starting with the uh, diffusion of innovation, or I, that's where I'm starting anyway and plenty more. So the diffusion of innovation, this is uh, Everett Rogers, uh, and he did his work in the 60s 19, and uh, continued until his death, which I believe was in 2004, and was very influential. Uh, he started out uh, trying to understand the um, adoption of seed corn in Iowa among farmers, and what he found is that uh, farmers were uh, would see what their neighbors were doing and they would see that their neighbors were having good luck with uh, a new kind of corn and so some, the more adventurous, would, would pick it up and then of course they would have success and then more would pick it up and there would be people who were fearful, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, but, uh, but he developed this idea of a curve of uh, acceptance. And this idea uh, has been popular and has been, people have tried to uh, force it, more or less, uh, with ideas like cool hunting. And uh, we, we've seen a lot of that in the last few years, which is uh, marketers going out and trying to find cool people, find out what they're doing, and then build something to uh, suit it, or find out where the cool people are and, uh, and give them it, <laughs> you know. Uh, we, uh, tennis shoes. Uh, uh, Nike and several companies are doing this quite actively with uh, tennis shoes. In this story, I uh, included a link to uh, the Cool Hunt. It was published in the New Yorker, and it's a fascinating study of how cool hunting is being used to seed products in the market. I think, I think in our business, one of the most effective cool hunters we've seen, as we all know, is uh, Apple. And they do a very good job of getting their products in front of the cool people. So here's, uh, at Rogers developed this well-known Gaussian curve that we all of us have probably been working with in some form or another. Uh, as, a, as an idea, technology, or product moves, it goes from innovator, early adopters, early majority, et cetera. The, uh, a variation on this uh, approach, of course, is also well-known, and also it's been introduced at this conference more than once, uh, which is uh, Jeffrey Moore's work uh, crossing the chasm, and uh, Moore, coming from Intel, w w very specifically looked at what happens when it's a disruptive technology, and uh, what happens when it fundamentally changes the way people work. And as you see, he changed the name of the, the people who are uh, adopting this technology. He, uh, he changed it to pragmatists, 
which I think is significant. It's, it's uh, asking, what will it take to make these practical people adopt something? And uh, let's see. So, and never, analysts are always ones to add one more curve. So uh, the hype cycle uh, kind of played on, uh, I, sh I should have mentioned, so Moore's work started around 91. Uh, Gartner Group came up with a hype cycle in around 95. And, uh, and w what they sort of added to the mix was, was what slowed up the uh, diffusion of ideas. And, uh, and what they saw was that there's a technology trigger, there's an idea that uh, gets people really excited and uh, it gets a lot of press. And then the product almost invariably can't live up to uh, the hype that's built up around it. And so, and so it gets a really unfair rap and is dismissed as being not good and, uh, uh, and has to work its way up. It has to stay in the market. It has to sort of do its time in purgatory and earn, earn its way up the slope of enlightenment. So to step back a little, oh, and social networking. Social networking, I think we're not quite sure what, what, how social networking is going to affect all this, except that it seems pretty obvious that it's speeding up the process of hype cycles and diffusion and, uh, and, and, and disillusion. If a product, God help them, doesn't work really early in the, in the game, the innovators are out there online talking about it and letting everybody know that it doesn't work. So I think, I think we might see these cycles get a little more dramatic. So here's my own take, yet another curve. Uh, the practicality gap, when I, I, what I do is I think it should be obvious is I've kind of munged all these different ideas together. But uh, there is a, tech, uh, a, a technology introduction. People see it as a good idea, but there are a lot of problems slowing it up in the market. And it, it's not just hype and it's not just attitude. It's also uh, the technology may not be ready for it. Uh, it may be too expensive. Uh, there may be not sufficient distribution channels established before the product comes out. And all those things have to be considered. And uh, so you're going to see a few improvements. You're going to see uh, Rev 1, 2, and 3. And, uh, and, and so it's important to sort of step back and think about where you are and where your ideas are and wh who you're talking to um, so that you're not disappointed or you don't blow all your money too early. So, uh, so here's a... Uh, theory doesn't work unless you try it out, right? So, um, so let's take MP3, which I think is a great example. Uh, because MP3, MP3 players, the minute you saw them, you thought, this is cool. I want one. We saw one over 10 years ago. And I remember at a, dinner, at a dinner table, somebody handed it to us. And we said, yeah, when can we buy this? And we could. They were available from, uh, from big players, from uh, crea uh, Creative, Rio, Samsung. And, uh, but uh, hard drives were expensive, uh, flash drives were expensive. The, uh, it wasn't really all that easy to get the music in, uh, from your CD into your computer, into the uh, player. The software just wasn't good enough. The interfaces were pretty bad. And, uh, and gradually the, uh, the improvements were made. But um, uh, probably one of the things that helped drive a, a hype cycle was the introduction of Napster and peer-to-peer -peer sharing. And uh, so there was plenty of press about the, uh, the capability and people were interested and wanted it. But not everybody, if you weren't a college kid, uh, wanted to get involved in this uh, mess that was even getting unsavory by this time. It was Apple that changed the model with the introduction of the iPod plus the iTunes. So it was a closed system, it was easy to use, you could get your music on it. And that helped uh, spur this market. And I think it's significant too. If you listen to Apple, you think that uh, they're the only ones selling an iPod or a MP3 player, and that's not true. Worldwide, uh, the, the players are, uh, the market's much more varied now. And, uh, and the MP3 player is certainly commoditized now. And to use another example is the um, PVR. I've got kind of a lot of these, so I'm hoping that uh, it doesn't get tedious. But if it does, <laughs> got a puppy. <laughs> so, 
Let's look at P PVRs real quick. And by the way, if you need the puppy, just raise your hand, because I got a lot of uh-oh buttons in here. So uh, that, uh, the uh, PVRs, again, were a, a product that was introduced, and clearly, clearly uh, there was a need for it. The, um, uh, anybody that wants, you know, watches TV likes the idea of being able to skip over commercials and uh, uh, stop the show when they get a phone call or whatever. But, uh, and the hardware and software systems were pretty well developed. C-Cube, NEC, Sigma Designs were early in with, uh, with uh, prototype systems. Uh, TiVo and Replay uh, built pretty big bo good boxes that were available in stores. But the problem was, you know, the, the average user, I think most average users, even just the concept went, this is not going to be easy. I can just tell right now. And even those that then were brave enough to try, took the systems home, had to set them up, had to get the network going upstairs in the living room, all those things that weren't necessarily given at that time. Even wireless was not uh, that ubiquitous. And what helped change the market for PVR was the cable companies and the satellite companies selling boxes with it all built in. So then it seemed, it's perceived as almost free to the consumer. And, uh, and, distrib and distribution was easy, and there was somebody to there was somebody to fix the thing if it didn't work, and and somebody came over and installed it for you. So th in other words, there's a system in place. It's not just the people. It's not just the product. You have to look at the whole system. So to step back a moment, uh, as I said, it's important to figure out where you are, where your idea is, where your technology is, who you're talking to, who that pragmatist is. And uh, I, uh, this woman, Tara Hunt, is a marketing consultant. She has a cute site called uh, horsepigcow.com. And uh, she talks about where are you? She, sa she says a lot of her clients are so concerned with crossing the chasm, they're getting into the early majority, but really they haven't convinced the in innovators and the early adopters. They're probably the people that maybe should be just seeding ideas and, and getting in front of uh, the cool kids and that sort of thing. So over the past year, since I saw you guys last, I, I feel like I've been to every trade show there is. And, uh, and what was sort of interesting is there are several ideas that came up consistently over and over again as ideas that uh, are really going to change the way we work and they're ready for main t mainstream. Uh, so this is where it gets even harder because I'm trying to look at products like from this point and where might they go forward. So I'm, I'm, we're going to try multi-touch, uh, rendering, uh, 3D print, and rapid prototyping. And okay, so let's start with uh, multi-touch. So, um, and one of the things with multi-touch, I thought it might be kind of useful to look at it in terms of the whole Gaussian curve, and uh, and, and one set of ideas. And uh, so, so uh, multi-touch was introduced in the 80s uh, at the University of Toronto. Uh, in 82, Nimesh Mehta wrote a paper, and, uh, and at the same time, Bill Buxton was at the um, uh, University of Toronto. He would, he would wind up going to uh, Alias and working on Maya. And, uh, and he published a lot of papers and a lot of ideas, and he's still doing it. He's at Microsoft now. Uh, but his idea was that you have to use two hands in a creative process because that's how the brain has always worked. That's how we've always made things. We use two hands to draw, even draw, you move the paper and you draw, or to shape clay. Uh, and and uh, he thought it would be a much more effective in, instead of these artificial interfaces that we'd been struggling with all this time. And uh, there's a paper online I found that's really uh, useful from Buxton, uh, multi-touch systems that I have known and loved. And because uh, Buxton's kind of, uh, of uh, exercise by the um, iTouch uh, and uh, Apple uh, technology because uh, he feels like maybe he's not getting credit for all that work he's done all before. But it's a good, uh, it's a good paper and he talks about the different takes on multi-touch. So and uh, one of the uh, popular, popular visions of multi-touch we've all seen in the minority report. And it's funny because like several conferences I've gone to this year, there's uh, the subject is the minority report. How close is it to reality? And, uh, and it's several CBITs, which is a giant trade show like Comdex or something like that in Germany, 
uh, we saw a lot of companies with uh, display systems for demos and that sort of thing that were big multi-type systems where you would uh, maybe use a GIS and move things around. But the, it didn't really get to be practical for mortals and uh, humans until uh, uh, 2004 and 5, Fingerworks introduced a small uh, uh, multi-type system with pinch, the pinching and, uh, a, and an inexpensive panel. They were acquired almost instantly by Apple. And so we, of course, know what happened then. Uh, we saw the introduction of the iPhone. And meantime, as I say, Buxton was at Microsoft, and there's been a lot of work done over there on the Surface, the Surface uh, uh, platform, which is a table. And um, you can um, move things around, and several people can collaborate on a project. And uh, sort of, I, I see it as coming at the idea of multi-touch from two different points of view. And there are more. Of course, we've also, uh, I don't know if any of you have seen it, but Jeff Hahn introduced, uh, it started a company called Perceptive Pixel, and he's in, uh, developed his own interface as well for um, moving things around on a screen and turning them and uh, pulling in different data and, and mixing it. And, uh, and I think, so one of the two things I think to look at is there's multi-touch in terms of just input, like a sort of an elaborate mouse, and that's what we're seeing. Uh, Apple's doing a lot with that. Uh, HP has done a lot with it uh, for their sort of home screen systems. And, but then we're also seeing, and what I think is very interesting, is the use of multi-touch in a, uh, as, as an integral part of an application and the interface so that, um, and, uh, like the Microsoft has an SDK, so we're, there's starting to be some very early applications to ship soon, uh, such as um, uh, video editing. And uh, uh, so you can, you can pull elements and move them around on the screen and maybe even collaborate with other people, say, let's try the music here, and you pull it in and put it down. It makes a lot of sense in terms of the way we would like to work. Um, and then uh, Autodesk at Autodesk University showed uh, the perceptive pixel system in use with Mudbox, with their uh, sort of clay modeling, so that you could actually use both hands and pull and push a model to make it happen. That's, that's the sort of thing that Buxton was talking about way back in 82, 3, 4, 5. Uh, finally, these sorts of things are, are coming to market, and it, I think it will change the way we work. Even if you're working with products with uh, a lot of layers, it seems to be really intuitive that you could be able to move these things around. So, because I wanted to show you this. Uh, this is uh, the Tamper system uh, developed by John, Under, John Underkoffler. And Underkoffler uh, of Oblong, Oblong Industries was the um, uh, technical director on Minority Report. So when you say, can we do this, and how soon will it be when the Minority Report system can be used, Underkoffler already had a system, and uh, he's proposing this as video editing. And as you can see, he's, he's got one hand that can slide and move the display around the other one, and the other hand to point and select. So and let's move on to desktop printing. Same thing. In the uh, 80s were an incredibly fertile period uh, for ideas that were probably were too expensive to do. But uh, the... Uh, uh, we saw rapid prototyping being introduced in the 80s uh, with 3D uh, Stratasys and 3D systems, CMEC, DMEC, uh, and several company, all companies all bubbling up at once and growing in that early 80s, early 90s, uh, or late 80s, early 90s area. And I should say, if Terry, I'm glad Terry Wellers isn't here because he would be probably appalled at how I just munge all this together. But uh, if, you, if you're interested in this, he's the guy to go to for more information, and he has a wealth of information on his site. But uh, I'm trying to do the quick view. So, um, so the problems, of course, with early systems where they were too expensive, the, um, and, the, and the materials were too limited. Uh, so there, there were only very specialized uses for these products, and the companies in general wound up having to go into service business, and I think they were probably, a lot of them were disappointed uh, that they weren't able to sell as many as they expected and wound up surviving on service, and many companies didn't survive. But all through this period, new materials were happening, new processes, uh, inkjet, quick cast, uh, which enabled like these complicated uh, uh, models with one inside of another, which I think is 
miraculous. Um, and um, did I say uh, metal? And even more durable materials. Uh, by about 2000, two, three solid dimensions, introduced the concept of a, a desktop printer. We started seeing prices come down for laminated uh, type processes. And, uh, and I, I put the a sort of relaunch period at around 2006 when we saw dramatic price, price drops from uh, Stratasys, uh, Z-Core, <laughs> what else do I have there? And 3D systems. And, um, but the other side of this uh, issue is sort of interesting too, I think, is that uh, in, in the meantime, Stratasys also introduced their own service system, uh, Red Eye, which is uh, overnight rapid prototyping. So you send in a, a, a file and you can get your model back the next day. And, um, and, and Stratasys says, well, you know, you might, for different models, you want, might want different systems. And, and a lot of companies can't afford to have every type of system uh, using every type of uh, uh, material in-house. So maybe it makes more sense to uh, go out to a service bureau if it can be turned around fast enough. And uh, so what we're seeing in desktop type systems are uh, things like hearing aids, teeth, uh, or orthopedic uh, equipment, things that are built to, uh, very specifically built to order. And that makes a lot of sense. Uh, on the other hand, uh, small run machine parts and that sort of thing might make perfect sense in going to uh, outsource. And uh, so one of the ideas here I'm thinking is that there's, a, there's two practicality gaps, really. There's sort of the high end and uh, how does this, who are you selling this system to? And then there's desktop printing. And it, you know, it really doesn't make sense to have a, a 3D printer on every desktop. God knows, you know, there's enough junk in the world. So uh, uh, I think that that's one of the values of, the, of looking at this gap is as you start mapping things out, you start realizing that these things aren't the same and they're not going to the same places. So uh, it becomes a useful exercise. Now, and this, is, this is the coolest thing, isn't it? It's uh, the RepRep uh, Do-It-Yourself 3D Printing Kit. It's only $600 and, and is, as they claim, it's self-replicating. I had a really hard time with that, but I think what the deal about the self-replicating is, is that you can make all these little, those little plastic pieces and then you can uh, connect them with easy, easy to get off the shelf tubing. Now, what you would actually make with this thing other than itself, I'm not so sure. <laughs> so let's go on to rendering. And, uh, and here's where uh, everybody in this room probably knows a lot about this. Uh, uh, the ice might get a little thin, especially because I do want to, I want to try to take us through quickly. But, uh, most of you guys I've known uh, since the very early days of desktop CAD and, uh, and systems were being sold at that time a lot of times with rendering or add-on rendering packages and the idea was somebody would uh, design something in CAD and then they would immediately make a rendering and, um, and some people did but, but it quickly became impractical as models became bigger and heavier uh, as, and of course as uh, companies the workflow changed and, uh, and also the people that thought that somebody would, would design a part and then render it often didn't really understand how the workflow went. That there's a guy that's under a lot of time pressure. It's not really his job to make it chrome and pretty. Um, and then the other side of it, what, so what happened a lot and more practically was there were official uh, renderers that the, and often, which is kind of a shame, the part would be rebuilt in, three, in Max or some other product and rendered. So it wasn't efficient, but it got done. And, uh, but it did sort of slow the uh, acceptance of uh, rendering in, in on the broad, on the mainstream. The other thing is that rendering took a really long time. And again, there's another priesthood where like, and we see that a lot in the DCC, where you do all this work to create a model, then you hand it off to somebody to get it rendered. And, and, in, and at one time, of course, this was days. And, and, but still now, it's a long time. And, um, and you guys probably are familiar with Jim Blinn's law. And Blinn's law is like, no matter how fast we can do the rendering, we'll just make it more complicated and more beautiful. So it's always going to take that long. It's just always going to take a long time. And, uh, but we're seeing some things that are finally shaking up uh, Blinn's law. 
and, uh, and that's hardware accelerated shaders. And they were introduced with OpenGL 2.0, the APIs, and DirectX 8. And what that meant was that people could build their own shaders, they could create their own look, it would be uh, accelerated, and, uh, and they would have something unique. It's, but that, that still didn't solve the problem of dealing with like, uh, heavy models with a workflow. Where that came into play uh, was uh, with several companies. Uh, we're just seeing now, as a matter of fact, Anarch Core introduced their, uh, 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 so it's a standalone CAD program where you can bring models in and simplify them, and then uh, use them for analysis or rendering. And then uh, within products, SolidWorks and Autodesk have both introduced, uh, uh, Autodesk has ShrinkWrap and um, SolidWorks has SpeedPack. And I think we'll see a lot of more of that, simplifying models so that you can use them for other purposes. And um, we've seen an explosion of companies in rendering uh, bunk speed, uh, Studio GPU, uh, Autodesk Showcase, and Luxology is building uh, modules within the programs for SolidWorks and MicroStation. They start to get push button easy. And, uh, and that does start to change the model a little bit and make it more possible for uh, people deeper into the workflow and broader parts of the workflow to see how a model works. And they might want to sell an idea. They might want to say, I want to do this. I think this part should be this way. And if they could show a model of it quickly, they might make that, their argument that much stronger. And if they don't lose any time, uh, it starts making more sense. So um, I, I think that the fundamental change that will happen with rendering is imagine being able to design something and then see what you're thinking almost as quickly as you're doing it. We're going to see this make a huge change in the digital content creation market where there's a real need to uh, see what you're doing. But I also think that it is going to happen more and more in, um, in, in the CAD field. And uh, it's very attractive to these rendering companies because it's a much broader market than digital content creation. So here's one more, here's one more piece of eye candy for you, which this is uh, caustic graphics. And, uh, and I put them, and I should have told you this a long time ago, but the, uh, the blue things in, in here are, um, I, I, I thought of as technologies, as enabling technologies, and the red things are more products. So I have caustic graphics here as uh, an enabling technology. They are a, um, a company they're building an FPGA to accelerate rendering. And uh, they claim that they can, right now on these uh, prototype boards, they can uh, accelerate rendering 30 times not using uh, caustics uh, hardware. And they hope to have a, a, a mass-produced pro product for the masses, more or less, uh, an add-in board in about another year. And they think that, uh, I, think, I think they said, and then they'll be able to speed it up even more 10 to 15 times. So that is getting us to the point, if they can do what they say they can do, that is getting us to the point where, where you can design something and then see it. And uh, they, they're, they're proof of concept. They bought a uh, splutterfish that makes the Brazil uh, renderer. And they've been, they've been using that to try and prove their point. And uh, they're hoping to uh, make deals with the other uh, rendering companies, including Mental Images and um, RenderMan, uh, and the companies we talked about. And that'll be interesting. Who knows if, uh, uh, you know, that we've talked to a lot of these companies and, you know, the eyebrows are raised. So Caustic will have to prove that they can do what they say they can. But I do think uh, it proves the point I'm trying to make is that it will, uh, faster rendering is on the way. So for the, my overall uh, point from this talk, I want to make two points. And one is the trends. These three trends that I kept hearing about and uh, seemed so important told me that people, people want to get their hands around a problem. They want to touch things. And what they really want to do, it's almost like we've lived two decades in our heads. The computer age has meant that we've lived in front of these boxes and, uh, and we have a real life and we have that computer life. But you know, as people are gravitating towards mobile computing, uh, social networking, uh, these ideas of working with both hands, of making prototypes, of, uh, so, you know, and as I say, like mobile computing, getting out and, and doing stuff out in the real world and checking your email. 
we, we want, we're tired of being inside this box. And I think that's the real overall trend, is we're moving out more into the real world. And, uh, and then the trend for my little baby productivity gap, practicality gap, is that there's not really just one. I think what I was trying to communicate uh, in these real world uh, and today models was that it, it's a process. It can, once, you, once you determine where your blockage point is here and you, and you get over that, you're not done. That's going, that's going to inspire you to go in different directions and, uh, or new, uh, new distribution opportunities may open. The technology may make some other uh, path possible for you. And so it's pretty important to know that it's not smooth sailing once again. You're not done just because you were successful over here. You've got, you've got a, the same process that has to start over and, uh, and look at it. I think they feed off each other and I think they, uh, it's like roads, winding roads. So uh, thank you very much. I'm done. <laughs> And if, if there's any questions, I'm ready for you. Oh, the puppy. <laughs> yes. What do you see as the future for the specialized graphics hardware manufacturers with the microprocessors moving to uh, multi-core mm -hmm. processors? We're only a few years away from probably having 32, 64 or more core processors. Well, and, you, and you've got those multi-cores both on the CPU and the GPU. Uh, and I think that's, that's really interesting and that, you know, whole nother talk probably. <laughs> but um, uh, and one of the, uh, one of the uh, uh, confusers that's coming into the market is Larrabee as well. I mean, and so Intel uh, is, is, is sort of promoting the concept that the whole world's going to be x86 and they can handle all these processors and the, the people that have been building uh, graphics processors all these years say nope with the advent of these uh, programmable shaders and uh, uh, new APIs and new programming technologies um, the, uh, the CPU and the GPU can share work. Uh, there's some things that CPU should be doing and there's some things that GPU should be doing. And it's our view that that's basically how the world is going to go, that the, there, there will be shared tasks and uh, that we'll be getting a lot more um, efficiency. Anybody else? Thanks a lot. <laughs>